as we continue to look at Psalm 23. Today we're going to be talking about the idea of how to face my enemies. And one of the things we struggle with sometimes in life is just the fact that we have enemies. Some people feel like that that's just something that we shouldn't have at all. But the reality is we're in a broken world. We're in a fallen world. We're in a world where people view things from their own personal perspectives and they never take God into account many, many times. And to be frankly honest, there are times in our own lives, even as believers in Christ, that we leave God out of the equation too. And we create our own enemies that way. If we decide to walk outside of Scripture, then we've set up things that are difficult in our life sometimes just simply by that. But there are, honestly, enemies in our life. There, there are people who, who disagree with us, disagree with God, disagree with the direction that God wants us to go. Everything is that way. And, and so how do you deal with those situations? And David is looking here and he's going, hey, look, when I'm surrounded by the enemy, what do I do? How does it look? I can tell you what, David brings us into the presence of an, of an understanding of God that he has that literally changes everything about how he views the enemy. And I want us to benefit from that. So today, even though we would recognize that there are enemies there, they may be surrounding us, our attitude of how we think about God is more important than how we think about our enemy. Okay? Because when we think about God in an appropriate way, the enemy becomes much, much smaller. Okay? So let's think about this. In Psalm 23, verse 5, it says, You, talking about the shepherd, the great shepherd, remember, the one who's taking care of everything, providing everything, protecting us. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. There, there's some powerful things that we can see here. The, the first thing I want us to understand is that David points out that my ultimate provision comes from Christ. Jesus is our ultimate provider. God is the one who oversees all of our needs. He is the great shepherd, the good shepherd the chief shepherd and he is supplying everything now if you're gonna look at this idea I, I think about it from the standpoint of you walk into a room you're at a feast and, and the tables there and literally there's not room for the plates there's just room for food and you've got all this food and all this everything here. You've got the food table and you've got the drink table and you've got the dessert table. You've got all these things that are there provided from a food standpoint. Matter of fact, the word table here does refer to the idea of a feast in the sense that it's not just enough. You know, so many of us kind of look at life and go, we'll make it through life as long as we have enough. From a Christian standpoint, God is saying, I want you to recognize I'm not providing you just enough to get by. I'm providing you an abundance so that you personally can get by, but so that also you can be a blessing for others. That'll come in later on as we look at it. The shepherd prepares the table. From an actual shepherding standpoint, a shepherd does prepare an area in, in the Middle East. There's an area that is called the Tablelands, which is literally a wonderful grazing area where they can take up the sheep 
and those sheep can have plenty of grass in, in difficult seasons. And, and so when you look at this and you think about it, what, what is he talking about? Well, if he goes up, the shepherd goes up ahead of time, the shepherd prepares that area for the sheep. Now, what's that mean? Well, sheep don't like running water. We've already heard about that, so he's going to make sure there's some still water somewhere that the sheep can drink from, and we've learned they drink a lot. Remember, we said the sheep can drink nine liters of water, an adult sheep can. So, in just one, one deal. So, he, he's made sure there's enough water. He's also made sure, because we know that sheep are not able to distinguish what's the good thing to eat and what's the bad thing to eat. It's sort of like when we, we put a popsicle and a piece of broccoli in front of our children and we go, which would you like to have? Well, I know as a kid which one I would have chosen. The popsicle always over the stick of broccoli. There was just that that joy there but if you eat popsicles all the time you don't stay healthy okay so the sheep don't know the good grass from the bad grass they don't know the the poisonous grass matter of fact uh, one of the shepherds I was reading about this last uh, couple of weeks ago actually he was saying that the that he goes to his field and he pulls out a certain kind of grass in his field like weeks before he begins that weeks before the sheep ever get up into that pasture area because it's not as bad for the older sheep if they take a bite of it but a lamb can take one of these clumps of grass and just eat one mouthful and it's deadly for them so the, the shepherd goes up ahead of time to remove the dangers that are there. If there's snakes in the field, he takes care of making sure the snakes are out. And, and if there's dangers of other kind, he marks those dangers so that he can be aware of them. And so literally the shepherd has already gone before them to make sure everything is right. And I want you and I to understand, our enemies don't come in and surround us with a God who was unaware of what was happening already. God has already prepared to take care of all of our needs, even in the midst of the attack of the enemies of life. So, when it says He has prepared the table he has taken care of all the needs he has prepared everything for us he is providing for us what we need each and every day listen to this Nehemiah says in Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 15 talking about the exodus from Egypt listen you provided bread from heaven for them for their hunger. You brought forth from a rock for them water from a rock for them for their thirst. And you told them to enter in order to possess the land which you swore to them. And as we've already said, while the children of Israel were wandering for those 40 years, the Bible tells us their shoe never wore out, their clothing never wore out, their feet did not swell. Now you think about that. God is taking care of all things. Now, Jesus talks about the fact that there is an enemy that is around us. Satan is one of our enemies. When he's talking about he is the good shepherd, in the midst of that relationship, he's talking about being the good shepherd. All of a sudden, he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it 
abundantly. So I want us to understand that the God we are worshiping, the God who saved us, did not just save you and me. He, he didn't look out and say, okay, I'm going to save Mike and Sangu, and I'm going to save all these other people, and, I, and he's going to call you by name. And, and as he does that, he's not saying, I am only saving you, and recognize you're saved one of these days. You're going to die, and you're going to be with me in heaven, and that's when you're going to be saved. No. He says, through the journey of life, I'm there with you. Through the journey of life, I'm providing for you. When you're surrounded by enemies, I will be the one who provides. I'm the one who sets the table, even in the midst of those types of situations. Okay, so God is our provision. The, the second thing I want to see that David points out, he says, in the presence of my enemies. So, my personal protection is provided by Jesus. So you think about this. Personal protection. The, the situation isn't one where you've got fortified cities and big walls and all this. This isn't the picture that he's displaying in this psalm. He's not saying, there in your fortress, God will protect you. No. Actually, it's saying, there within sight of the enemy the enemy can look at you see you know everything I, I think about the fact when we lived in Africa we used to kid and say even though Africa is huge matter of fact think about this you can take all of China all the US all of Eastern all of Western Europe you can put them on the continent of Africa and have land left over that's how huge Africa is drawers of maps, world maps, like in the early 1900s, decided that they would draw Africa smaller on a world map than it actually was so that it wouldn't look so overwhelming. So that's why sometimes when you look at some maps, Africa seems huge, and other maps it doesn't seem so huge. So make sure you're looking at a map that is accurate, okay? Our country was quite large. It's a small country on the map, but it's a large land area. There were only about 10 to 12 million people living in the whole country. And one of the things, I mean, if you were driving across the country, it would take you about 18 to 20 hours driving 110 kilometers an hour just to get across the country. And there were vast areas that you'd drive through there, it looked like there was just nothing. I remember one time our family, we were trying to do a picnic. And so we stopped in one of these vast open areas, pulled out our, our blanket and our, our stuff to lay out for the meal. And we were with another missionary family. We laid everything out, and all of a sudden there were people standing around us. And we're like, oh, well, it's not as private as we thought. And we thought, well, you know, okay, we'll just... Because we just wanted to go somewhere private, okay? So we go to another little area. We, we look and we see, man, we can see a lot further here. And, and, and we put our stuff down and we started eating. And then all of a sudden this little guy comes by on a bike and he waves and another guy comes up and about eight or ten other people start walking in. You know, it's like, we're, we're there. We, we see people. Well, they could always see us no matter where we were. I want you to understand, the picture here is not that you're hidden away in a fortified city, but that you're out in the open where everybody else can see you and everything is there and the enemy is looking at you and they can't do anything about it. God is the protector. He is the one who allows us in the middle of our enemies being there to sit down in perfect security right there in the middle of everything. Now, this is, this is so unlike a, a normal battle scene because if you're a warrior in a battle, you're, you're barely able to get the battle rations. You're worn out, you're weary. And the picture that Jesus is painting here, that God is painting and David is putting here, is the fact 
that even in the midst of being in the presence of the enemy, there is a sense of rest, a sense of peace, a sense of provision. There's no need to hurry. There's no weariness here. There's no confusion. There's no fear. Everything is okay. God says, I want you to recognize I'm the one who's providing everything, and I want you to recognize one of the things I'm providing is for your protection. Now think about this. You're the enemies of the Hebrews. You're watching them come out of Egypt. You don't like them. Now I want you to think, when they came out of Egypt, how much of a military might were they? Zero. They didn't have a military. When they came out of Egypt, how much of a political threat were they? Zero. They didn't have a leader other than Moses, and many of them didn't like Moses. I mean, a lot of them just left because... This is our way out. They weren't following God. They weren't following everything. From, they were just getting out of Egypt. So they're, they're not even a nation yet. They're a threat to no one, but they are threatened by everyone. They've got no leadership structure, no government mandate, no military, they're totally helpless. And yet God displays exactly what David is talking about because right there in the presence of their enemies, when think about this, one of the most common tactics then and in many places now for fighting a battle is to stop the food supply. The Romans were excellent at this. Matter of fact, when Jerusalem fell in A.D. 70, about one million people were starved to death in the city before they ever stepped inside. They didn't need to be a military strength to overpower the people. The people were already destroyed. They cut off their food. Can you imagine being the enemy and surrounding the people and all of a sudden you realize... We're going to starve them out. And the next morning, there's manna on the ground. Well, we'll stop their water supply. Moses takes his staff and touches a rock and... <laughs> la -da -da -da. There's food. There's water. Well, it's, it's not going to last long. Forty years straight. Every morning, every day, they had all their provisions needed. There was no way for them to be starved out. Now you think, back then, you think about it. If, if you could be under restriction and under, you were surrounded by your enemy and you never ran out of food and you never ran out of water and you never ran out of any need you had, because that's exactly what God took care of. You never needed to go get shoes. You never needed to go buy clothes. You never needed any toiletries for your house. You never needed anything. What kind of threat would your enemy be? That's what God is wanting us to understand. Yes, Satan is powerful. Yes, he's a roaring lion seeking to devour everything he can. Yes, he is a terrible enemy. But no, he is not God. He is not equal to God. He is not even similar to God. He has no authority over God. He has no authority over God's people unless we choose to look that direction. Let's look to God. Second Samuel chapter 22 verse 2 says, He said, The Lord 
is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. He's not talking about I'm in a fortress. He is saying even in the wide open God is my fortress. It's amazing. In Matthew chapter 10 verse 28 and 30 through 31 it says, "Do not fear those who can kill the body, but are able un unable to kill the soul, but rather fear, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. So I want you to understand and me to understand that God provides for us and God protects us. So when, when we see God's provision and His protection, then that changes the way we see the enemy. Our focus is not on the strength and the power and the authority and all that the enemy has. Our focus is on the fact God is in charge. Third thing I want us to see. David points out that my individual worth flows out of Jesus. And you may go, well, wh what, what? Listen, it says, you have anointed my head with oil. That whole process is the fact that God has a specific attitude toward me. He has an attitude that I am His and He's taking care of me. And we've already seen where oil can sometimes be a healing thing, but at this particular point, that's not what I was talking about. What it's talking about is oil is also used from the standpoint of in that area of the world, when someone comes in to eat, if they are an honored guest, if they are someone who is distinguished or something like that, you always put oil on their head. It's a perfumed oil. You put it on their head. It's a symbol of your recognition of the fact that they're distinguished or they're special or, or they're special to you and your family. So you think about that. God says, you are coming to this place under my provision, under my protection as my distinguished guest. Now, I, I realize that's a stretch for some of the people that are listening right now. They don't see themselves as distinguished guests of anything. I don't have a job that's important. There's no such thing as an unimportant job. I, I don't have the family that I come from that's got the proper kind of background. I don't come from the caste that is meaningful. You're missing it. It's not about what you and I think of us. It's about what God declares about us. God doesn't say you and I are a group of nobodies with unimportant places and unimportant things. He says that you and I are important. We are His. We belong to Him. And we need to understand that. In Psalm 45 verse 7 it says... You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your fellows. In John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, You, as, as, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So as a believer... We are anointed with the Holy Spirit. We are in the presence of God. We are His children. And you know, that becomes marred in our way of thinking because 
We watch as families have favorites. I'm, I'm from a family where my dad was one of uh, 13 or 14 kids and, and my, my uh, uh, father-in-law was one of 12 kids and, and you know, you kind of look at it and you go, okay, yeah, there were favorites in that situation. You know, some got more than others, some did better than others, some were viewed differently than others. And we sometimes take that and say, well, you know, I hope I'm a child of God that God will, will like. Do you know what? God doesn't just like you. He loves you. God just doesn't think that you need to have some type of relationship and provision from him he gives that to you your viewpoint of you and my viewpoint of me sometimes minimizes who God is you know what one of the commandments is don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain that concept means don't belittle God in any way I believe that when you and I view ourselves as less than what God says we are, we are breaking that commandment because we are calling God less than capable of producing in us what He is truly capable of doing. The vast majority of the time, the failures in our life are not because of God. It's because of us not listening to God and not acting on what God says about what we need to do. That's not a God failure. That's a me failure. That's a you failure. But God says, change your view to look at you the way I do. And then the last thing. David points out that my ability to bless others is supplied by Jesus. Now think about this. He says that my cup overflows. Now the Bible tells us that when we're talking about the enemy, talking to the enemy, understanding the enemy... We need to understand that the enemy cannot threaten our provision. The enemy cannot threaten our protection. The enemy cannot threaten our identity. And that in the middle of that, God asks us to look at our enemy differently than we would normally do it. He says, you have a well inside of you that will overflow. Matter of fact, Jesus said, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. And I love the fact of what he says. He just didn't say, come, come bring your cup and get a drink. He says, when, when you get a drink from him, in the innermost part of your life, he places there a flow from a river of living water. Now, in my home area is the Mississippi River. On a normal day, it's one mile wide. On a flood stage, I've seen it as many as 42 miles wide. Uh, I've had many times that I've not been able to take trips to town from my home community or my home house because the road was underwater. It's a lot of water. But even on its smallest day, I can't drink all the water that it provides. Matter of fact, within just a few hundred yards walking distance from my parents' back porch is where they took a pipe. It was about eight to nine feet long. It was driven down into the ground, and, and then the dirt was cleaned out. And you know what happened when the dirt was cleaned out? all of a sudden water started flowing out of that pipe. 
Water has flown out of that pipe for more than 40 years. It's an artesian well. It's a constant source with a constant pressure that's constantly flowing water. I can't even drink the water that provides. Because if I put my cup there and drink, I'm full long before the water ends. And that's the picture God is letting us know. I am going to pour into your life to a point of overflowing. So what happens with the overflow? Well, you know, listen to what Jesus tells us. Luke chapter 6, verse 27 and 28. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. You're surrounded by your enemies. Love them. How, how, do, you, how do you do that? Well, you do good to those who hate you. Look, it's, it's an action. You and I are called by God to do good for them. And you know why we don't do good for them most of the time? Is we don't feel like they deserve it. There are enemies. But I want you and I to understand we didn't deserve the love that God gave us either. And He did good for us. He died on the cross so that our sin could be paid for. He was buried and He rose again so that we could be justified before God. He did good. And He's calling on us to do good to those who hate us. He goes on to say, bless those who curse you. Bless them, not curse them. I've been guilty of saying a saying from the West. I don't know if it works here in Hong Kong, but we, we would say if someone is, is bad, give them enough rope and they'll hang themselves okay uh, isn't that pretty much the same as cursing them yeah sometimes we're guilty of that mindset in our attitudes of inaction we just don't want to bless them. It, we're, we're more like Jonah than we would admit. Jonah was really, really mad at God when the Ninevites repented of their sin because he knew God would love them and would turn them into people that he loved. I'm convinced sometimes we don't bless our enemies because we don't really want our enemies to experience the love of God the same way we have. But God says, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. That's hard. But when we do that, it changes everything. We think of this next passage I'm going to draw to. We, we think of it more in its New Testament concept, but I picked it out of its Old Testament concept because sometimes we think the New Testament is drastically different from the Old Testament. No, it's not. Listen to what was taught in Proverbs. You'll hear it echoed in the, in the New Testament, even by Jesus. If your enemy is hungry... Give him food to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will be heaping coals, burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Now, this heaping burning coals, that's not saying you're going to make them really feel bad. What it is saying is that you're going to continually be a blessing to them but because you're continually being a blessing to him or her and they don't understand what's going on 
their minds are going to be wrapped around that and it's going to constantly be trying to figure out why. Why in the world would you love me when I've been your enemy? Why in the world would you like me when I've hated you? Why in the world would you do good to me? And you know what? All I can do is point back and all you can do is point back and say it's not because of me. It's because God provides for me. God protects me. And my identity is in Christ. And as a result, I can be a blessing to you because I'm not blessing you out of what I've got so much as the overflow. I like what a little girl one time said. Uh, in her prayer, she said, Lord, fill my cup. I don't have a very big one, but I can overflow a lot. You know what? That's what we need to do. So, how do we deal with our enemy? It's not by ignoring them. It's not by other things. It's by focusing on God. And in the middle of it, learning how God can allow me to be a blessing to that enemy so that they can eventually know Jesus Christ. Now, very briefly, I know that some people will go, but what about our enemies that are already believers or say they're believers? Treat them the same way. And pray for them that God will open up their hearts. Because... God can do something for them and in them that you and I cannot do. So, uh, we'll talk about forgiveness and some other things in another session. But today, understand that when you face your enemies and they're there, God provides, God protects. God adores who you are. But God is also going to bless you for the purpose of overflowing so that you can be a blessing to the enemy also. Today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, it's hard to focus on those kinds of attitudes and see them as something that you could possibly even do. But in your, in your life today, would you say, God, let me be changed in my attitudes to move away from focusing on the enemy to focusing on you. Give Jesus your life first. And as a believer, trust Him and walk with Him. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you give us. Thank you for the blessings. Thank you for the difficulties that you walk us through. Lord, help us to understand how we can be a blessing even when we're surrounded by our enemies. Thank you for all that you do for us. Walk with us. Strengthen us. Encourage us. And allow us to follow after you with all of our heart. In Jesus' name, amen.